What's happening, everyone? Today, we have another validator AMA because you never know when that mainnet button is going to be pressed. You never know. And we want to be ready with their validators, right? We want to be ready. Oh, it's been a long day. It's been a, a good one. Productive, sunny up in here. Been outside most of it. And uh, I was like, I ah, almost don't even want to come inside because it's so nice outside right now. I have such long winters here, so try to make the most of the sun when I have it. However, I said I was going to do an AMA today and I got a lot of stuff to cover as far as security goes, primary uh, topic, of course, it's AMA. So whatever other issues you're having, feel free to put them in the chat, but we're going to, uh, we're going to cover a lot of security stuff, a lot of backups. Then this applies to Ethereum, Pulse Chain. Um, a lot of it will apply to both because a lot of it's uh, local security and some network security stuff as well, but just the basics. Um, so a lot of you don't know my, you know, I'm my professional experience is in security and uh, being able to defend against attackers and stuff like that. So I may know a little bit of what I'm talking about. I may have some nuance that could be helpful and kind of tell you what works, what doesn't work, where you should spend time on what I care about, what I don't care about. So hopefully give you a, uh, the ability to be confident in your security posture on your validator as well as, you know, backups and stuff too. And yeah, there's not, you know, I'll, I'll get into it, but even if your validator does get hacked, uh, yeah, de minus one point for decentralization because it may go offline. They may, you know, get you slashed and stuff like that. But, you know, if you use snapshots, use backups, you can uh, restore service and get back to get back to business. But it's not like if they hack your validator that they're going to steal all your money. It's not how that works. And I put a lot of research, so I'm getting more and more confident around the blockchain side and, and the validator side as well. So I'm trying to speak a little bit more on it as I become confident because they want to tell you anything that's wrong, not true. I want to give you as much nuance as possible. I know a lot of this is complicated, so I'll try to try to break it down for you. That being said, let's talk to the chat. What is happening, Vets in Crypto? Good to see you, local hexagon. Oi, oi, bang, bang. Can we do a walkthrough of how to set up screen share remote access with Ubuntu? Dave's going to help me with this validator. Huh. Hmm. I don't know if I'll demo step by step, but I can definitely cover how that works on Ubuntu. Okay. There's a few different ways to do it. Yeah. We can go through that. Let me, um, I'll go through that first and then we'll get into the security part and you can ask some questions too. So we'll go through that first because that's probably important. People can benefit from that as well. What's up, MA? What's up? Made it today? Yeah, you did. You certainly did. Furu Finance. Have you subscribed to Furu Finance? He's a, he's the news guy. He's a guy that gets the people going and covers a lot of stuff and uh, been killing it lately. So good to see you, man. Appreciate you showing up. If nothing else for the algo, if you're sitting in the bow there, let me know. Uh, love, to, love to hear more people getting into the nerdy side of Pulse Chain, pulsechain.com. Hexy Babe. Hi, Pulse Chain. Welcome, Hexy Babe. Welcome. Good to see you. I'm seeing shorts over here. I know somebody else requested access today. Somebody must have shared the link and uh, somebody requested access. I need to prove that when I get a chance. I just saw it on my phone, but yeah, man, it's a uh, virality, right? Virality. It's happening. AWS security posture. Yeah, we'll be going over that. There's a lot of benefits to using cloud providers, the platform they provide. Uh, there's a lot of security. Good stuff about that as well. And I'll give you both sides that versus home any good or did you need paid for a virtual uh so you can do a uh, vpc you can set up one of those but that's kind of more for virtual private uh doing like a little network so kind of like if you have for example i'm pretty sure the devs if i were to speculate the devs who are using the cloud for a lot of validators it certainly seems they probably have a vpc and that is kind of like your virtual network outside the internet. It's kind of like having a home network, but inside the cloud. And, you know, there's benefits to doing that in certain scenarios. But if you're just running a validator and you're not needing to, if you're not running multiple validators or nodes that you want to talk to each other within a secure network, then I think it's kind of overkill. I mean, the biggest thing on AWS is just configuring the security groups, aka the firewall. They call it security groups. It's like, Wow, another term for something that's literally the firewall. Bunch of different specific AWS uh, information and 
and stuff. So if you were to get a VPC, I believe maybe it is extra. I'm not sure. I've set one up before, but it's been a while. But you don't need that for a validator, in my opinion. You can do plenty of other stuff. Yeah. What's up? Is Crispy Man here? I shared with him. Yeah, I, I, was Crispy setting the validator? I can't remember. I can't remember. Logic control traffic, more security. Yeah. So you can do a lot of things in isolation away from the internet. So yeah, but it's again, what are you doing? If you're just if you're just running a single validator, it's talking to other validators over the internet that aren't yours. Why would you need to put on an own special network inside the cloud? I I can't think of why you'd want to do that unless you have other servers inside there that you all want to talk to each other, but not necessarily talk to the cloud. You want to do like a reverse proxy type scenario where you want certain services to be hit from inside of VPC that aren't, you don't want to publicly expose, but you want there to be a gateway to kind of access them. So there's certain scenarios, but I wouldn't worry about it. I would not. I would not spend all the time learning about VPC to run a validator. If you're just running a single valid, like, you know, if you're running a single server, I would not worry about VPCs, in my opinion. What's up, Franklin? Good to see you, man. Gucci. I miss, I miss Richard's uh, Gucci stuff. I wish I got some new pictures of him doing that stuff. You know, I love all his phases. I think they're all useful and beneficial and funny and, and shake my head at the same time in different ways. Security backup validate and restore quick compromise. Are you saying VPCs do that? Because I don't see what why they would help do that. It's just, again, it's just a private network inside the cloud where, like, why would you need, if you have a single server, that's not a network. So why would you need to put that behind a VPC? I don't see any benefit. I mean, you can restore it quickly if it's a single server to do snapshots, which I'll talk about as well. Real quick, one more question before we get into Lily's question about uh, remote access. Space D is double seven. Can we run a pulsing validator or a Windows laptop running virtual Ubuntu? Ah, I'll answer the first part first. Sure, but why would you why would you want to do that? That's the question I would have. So if you're running a virtual machine, that means you need to dedicate resources from that physical computer to run the virtual operating system. So you're going to need, first of all, you're going to need a really beefy laptop to do that. Because if you want to dedicate 32 gigs of RAM to that virtual machine, you need more than that on your physical. So you need like a really beefy 64 gig laptop. You need more, you know, disk space probably isn't a problem. Um, you're sharing processing power. I just wouldn't do it that way. Um, I wouldn't run it on a regular laptop either because laptops, they're just not servers. They're just not the right tool for the job. Can you do it? Sure. You can do anything. Would I do it? No, I wouldn't. Um, you certainly can. If yes, would it be more secure to use a VPN on Windows? I don't know what VPNs have to do with this scenario. VPNs are, I have a whole rant on VPNs, but I'm trying to be very objective right now. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think VPNs and validators have anything. I don't think there's any benefit to running any kind of VPN stuff with validators that I can think of. A VPN lets you access another private network and use that for internet. If you're running a validator at home, you're letting people come onto your network and access your computer. So VPNs, yeah, not applicable as far as I can see. One more question from me. It's your question, there are penalties, validator going down. What happens if the hack still gets penalized? Yes, so the more time, there's this, so there's penalties versus slashing. I guess you can think about them, the analogy in the old uh, distributed POS is like misdemeanors versus felonies. You can, there's sort of some uh, parallels there. So a penalty is like, hey, if you, if you miss some blocks, you miss some attestations, whatever, for an hour, a few hours, something like that, then you get penalized uh, with pulse and stuff. If you get hacked and you go offline for days or you start like trying to assign blocks that aren't yours, then if the network sees that there's some serious problems, you're just not communicating. Why are you on the network? Why are you in this pool? Then you may get slashed. So that's like the worst. So worst case that happen if your validator gets hacked is you get slashed because they probably do something malicious with it, which they probably won't. They. I need to think more about like why you would even hack a validator unless you just want to cause disruptance on the network or you believe, I guess 
if you believe you can somehow get to the seed words from there, if you believe they made a mistake, you put your seed words on the validator, which you should never do. You shouldn't generate them there. You shouldn't put them there. Only your keys, not your seed words. There's a difference. If you don't know the difference, look at the wiki. I, I go over that stuff. Um, or they believe from the validator, then they can get on your other, they can get on your network, maybe get on other computers where you may have your seed words. Yeah, I'm trying to think about like why you would even hack a validator if more, more than likely the seeds aren't there. I guess you, the hacker would believe they could get to your seeds eventually. So if you're running a home, that's especially another security concern because that's what, you know, I don't, that's why I don't like running things at home. I don't like run public servers at home. Yes, good for decentralization. However, the huge trade-off is if you get hacked and you don't have it on a different network than your home network, which you probably don't, but you can, you can put another router, you can separate connect that to the internet. It's different than all the other computers. Just, you know, basically use two routers. It's one way to do it or other advanced networking stuff. But if they hack your validator running at home and they, on your local network, there's a lot of attacks you can do on a local network that don't work over the internet. They, you know, the common thing is the internal network is squishy. External network, hardened perimeter. Internal network, usually squishy because you assume that it's harder to hack and get into it first. So you're not protecting the local stuff. So if somebody gets on your local uh, network, it's, you know, for a lot of stuff, it could be game over. There's a lot of attacks. You can go read about Windows and Linux attacks locally and different tools to do that. They're pretty commoditized at this point. So that's why I don't like running stuff at home because even though I can separate my network, I don't even want to take the risk. I don't want somebody to be on my computer doing malicious stuff. If somehow I got hacked, I don't want, you know, them trying to do stuff and me getting blamed for it or anything. I just don't want anything to do with that. So that's why I'm, nope, cloud server. I'll pay extra for it, whatever. I want that peace of mind. However, decentralization is the uh, obvious advantage there. So good question. You got me going on the, um, what happens if validator gets hacked deal? Good, uh, good lead off. I swear, Lily, I'm going to get into it. Just uh, it may is asking some good stuff too. No, you want to keep the validator public to reduce latency. You want to keep the validator as public to reduce latency, max performance. Not sure what that was in reference to. That could validator should be secure as, as if you need to restore quickly. Yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, you wouldn't want somebody to um, backdoor your backup, right? So yeah, keep those safe as well. Mike Bar, do you have validator work for six hours, suddenly stop? Any idea what calls this? Um, well, there's some debugging commands on the wiki. Let me pull up the wiki and I can point you to some debugging commands so if you can see if it's on your side or not. This can be a fun AMA. I'm already enjoying talking about some of this stuff myself. I mean, security, again, is my, is my deal. So usually people aren't interested in it, but um, putting in the form of validator talk, it's actually uh, pretty fun. So if you all haven't seen, I've added some table content. So it's easier because the wiki was just getting super big here. I call it a wiki. It's a readme, markdown, whatever. So I put a table of contents, you easily click around, debugging. So if you click debugging, drop this in the chat. Then you can check on your sync progress. Again, this is, I just use Geth and Lighthouse uh, for all my validator stuff as of now. So these are all specific to them. I think the Geth one also works on Aragon, but in general, these are pretty specific. And then if you want to look, so Mike, I would say, take a look at your status and see if you see any uh, errors going on here. And then, huh, where's the, uh, where's the journal command? Oops. Did I, oh, here we go. So I guess I should, that should be also be in the debug section, but you run this, run journal CTL dash U on the service, you run on each one, Geth, Lighthouse, whatever, and use, use um, dash F. At dash F just means give me the latest logs. Otherwise it'll start from the beginning. So do this, use dash F, just like I mentioned here, and it will give you better debug information about what's going on. So check that out. OVP in question. Okay, got you, May. All right, let's go to Lily's question because it's the interesting one. I and mean, they're all interesting, but I, I want to get to this. So how do we do remote access for Ubuntu Linux? 
So, Lily, can you elaborate a little bit? Are you on? Are you saying on a local network? Because if you're doing this on a rented server or cloud, then okay, maybe you're doing this for for this get someone to help you debug things. Maybe that's what it is. Okay. Because I was just thinking, like, why would you want to do that? Would you set up a screen share remote access? Okay. So maybe you want someone to help you on your validator. You got to be careful with that stuff. Um, so you can turn on, uh, what is it? Ubuntu remote access. I refresh myself. So yeah, there's screen sharing, which turns on, what is that service called? I forget. Yeah, VNC and RDP. So those are the two. So I would follow this if you're interested in doing it. You got to be careful though, because you start opening up um, start opening up stuff on your computer. You got to make sure you have strong passwords and stuff because if you do remote access, you can do it through SSH, but it's a little more complicated. A lot of people just turn on the uh, sharing setting and use VNC, which uh, does password authentication. So just make sure you do that. And there's a bunch of security nuance around it too. Yeah, connect. So you turn that on and then you're going to need to open it on your firewall. If you're doing it at home on your local firewall, you're going to need to open up, was it 5901 or one of these ports and then give them the password securely. You got to figure that out. How to not get that stolen. And it's got to be a way to do like strict by IP access too. Anyways, this is probably the simplest way to do it is start the VNC server, do uh, sharing. And then there's different options for that. So I, I would look at that. And uh, I mean, I don't have a whole lot of nuance other than be careful how you share the password with them so it doesn't get compromised. I would turn it off after they're finished. So you don't, don't leave it hanging on the network where someone else, because there's people who you know, brute force passwords, and make it sure it's a, a very good password. And you don't want people even trying to, you know, knock on your service and, and try to get in because that would, that would be bad too. So yeah, that's, that's what I would say on that one. I'll leave it up there. If you have some more, uh, some more access then, or some more questions on that, feel free. All right, so let's do some security stuff. I'm gonna start with, this is a really good article that gives you some new ones too. And yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat and I'll get to them as I can. So, what do attackers want? We'll start with that. Let's see. Yeah, so there's different attacks, reorg. There's double finality, finality delay. I don't want to go through each one because I know it's you know, probably going to be boring if I go through the technical details too, but this is a pretty good article. Let's see. What, what did I see that was pretty interesting from this? Attacking the protocol. This helped me like, kind of wrap my head around the different attacks too. See, yeah, attacking the protocol. Anyone can run the client software to add a validated client. User required to do 32 Ether or 32 million pulse. Pause the contract. Validator now has a voice to influence contents. Yeah, so this is interesting. I think the the one thing I want to talk about here, and you can you can read more about this, but the cool thing is they explain the different what can happen. So attackers using greater than or 32 33 percent of the total stake. So. Uh, all the attacks mentioned previously, the article has been more likely to see them as a state to vote. So 33% is they have the ability to prevent the chain from finalizing. So that's interesting. And then 50% is theoretically they split the chain in two, two equally sized forks, and then simply use the, the entire 50% to vote contrarily to the honest validator set. Inactivity leak on both forks eventually lead to chains to finalize. Yeah. And at that point, they'll fall back to shows for recovery. Interesting. And then attackers using greater than 66% of the total staked coins, whatever it is, Ether or PLS, can finalize their preferred chain without having to coerce any honest validators. So, yeah, you definitely want to avoid this. You want to avoid 50%, you want to avoid 33% of centralization but you really want to avoid 66% because uh, that looks like what we think of at the 51% attack. But 
this is kind of like, okay, 66%, they kind of control the chain, right? By purchasing Ether to control 60% rather than 51%, the attackers effectively bind the ability to do post reorg. So a lot of stuff, again, it's a lot of controls in place to make this not worth it. If you buy that much and you have that much, why, why are you going to destroy the value by causing disruption in the network, right? So it's kind of this check and balance on that too. Yeah, so anyways, this is interesting. Kind of helps you learn about blockchain stuff. I'm not going to talk about blockchain stuff very much today, but I thought that was worth bringing up. So that's in the chat if you guys want to look at it. Go to the chat real quick and say hi before we go into the best practices. Very good article. What's up, Bruno? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Good to see you. Glad you could join us, learn some stuff. Deep stakes. What's happening, man? I know. I know. It is exciting times. Exciting times indeed. All right. So this is one of the best articles I've found that comes across the security side of validator. And again, this applies a lot of it applies to Ubuntu. And I mean, that's what a lot of my scripts and stuff are based on too. So this is the, one of the things that a, so this is, so if you do AWS, this happens automatically. When you spin up an instance on AWS, you get a user named Ubuntu and it has pseudo privileges, passwordless pseudo privileges, which is effectively like your admin, your root. So you can become root anytime you want. You don't want to do things as root because one, it's dangerous. You may do something because you have, it's like you're, you have full control over the system and you don't want to be typing commands in that you may not understand the, the full effects of. You may typo something, which could be really bad. Do that as root. Things get deleted. System could crash, all this stuff. That's why the whole concept of not being root, not being an administrator happens. And only you need to become it to you use sudo to become that and run commands as that, as needed. So you can run regular commands as a regular user, do a typo. It only affects your user account or you know, stuff you own. You mess up as root, could affect the entire system. That's why that's that's why there's different users, not just, you know, that's why there's separation of privileges between users and admin users and root. So think of the Ubuntu user that's default on ABS, for example. If a user has pseudo privileges, they could have a password, which requires them to type one in in order to execute commands as root, or it could be passwordless, which means they just they can put pseudo. And let's see if I have yeah, I still have a terminal here. They can do. Oh, did it reset? Let's see. Let's see if it's still, oh, cool, it's still there. So they would do like sudo ls, and this is gonna give me an error because it's not it's not a real machine. They do ls, we're gonna do sudo ls. So this means run as root, this means run as current user, if you have access to root. So the first thing they talk about here is is not doing things as root, basically. He's a non-root user. So in this in this in our script, I go even beyond that, which they may talk about on this as well. And I create a whole different user that has no admin privileges to run the programs as, to run the clients as. And that is the node user. And the node user, you can change it anything you want. Just change this to my life is awesome if you want. <laughs> change it to lit. Go go for it. Uh, but I just use node because it's generic, makes sense. And when it creates a user, it doesn't give it a shell by default. And it's, uh, it's a user with, that doesn't have admin privileges. So it can't run sudo command. So that means if someone hacks your client and they get node privileges, they don't have root privileges, which is one more layer of uh, preventing them from getting full access and control of your server. They still have access to everything node does, which is a lot of your stuff. I mean, it's running your clients, so it has access to your validator keys probably and all that stuff too but they can't get access to, uh, they can't fully control the server, say that. So that is one thing we do. So I recommend that, uh, creating a separate user to run everything as, again, if you run the script, it does automatically. And then disable password authentication. So if you use AWS again, this is automatically done. There is no, I guess you could set it up to use a password, 
default, by default, it uses SSH keys only. Now you can put a password on your SSH key, which is more secure, of course. Uh, think of your SSH key as your key equals, like your seed words equals your money. Think of your key as your password, but it's something you own, not something you type in. So you would literally need to leak the file and you can't just type the file in anywhere. You probably wouldn't do that. You can, but it's much less likely than you would leak a password or reuse it. There's no password reuse. It just removes a lot of the attacks from passwords. So keys are much more secure than password auth. Even if you use a really good password, you can use a key and password auth if you want. It's obviously more secure because then you provide the key, something you have in addition to something you know, the password. But by default, AWS just does keys only without key plus password, no password auth, keys only, but not by default key plus password. SSH key is, is fine for basic stuff. You can read more about that here. So that's your remote authentication. That's the only services you, you should be having open is your remote access, which you can, on AWS, you can narrow down to specific IP ranges. So you can say, I don't want everyone in the world to access this. I only want people coming from my particular ISP because my IP maybe changes some, sometimes or my particular IP address. But if it changes, you get to update it. You can lock it down so people can't even access it unless they're coming from your computer. So there's another more stuff you can do uh, for that. Only SSH, if you're doing this from the cloud, for example, because you need to remotely access it for management. And your clients, you got to open up with port 30303 and I forget the uh, Lighthouse one, like 9100, 9200, something like that. Those are the only ones you should have open on your, on your system. And then up to date. So this is something I have a script for as well. So when I set up a new AWS instance, I set up a new server, you know, I use this script or uh, a lot of times it just sets your host name. It tells the uh, login thing to be quieter and it does all your updates and it reboots for you. So I do that when I spin up a new server, I do, I run the script or do the, do it manually first to make sure I'm good to go. I get a good starting ground. I don't need to update later. You know, I set my host name. It can be anything you want, all that stuff. And your firewall. So this is your local firewall. So you have a global firewall, your network firewall. And that is something it's called security groups on AWS. Uh, it could be your router at home. Uh, let's see. I think I have a section on this on the readme. Let's do security. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. I'll add this in there afterwards. So yeah, the, so 9,000, that's the Lighthouse port. And these are Geth and uh, Aragon, I believe they use the same ones. And this is for Lighthouse. And let's see. Yeah, so these are security groups on AWS. So 22, uh, 12. And then, oh, there's also like 13,000, 12,000, I believe. Let's see what I set in. Let me duplicate and see if I can go to my script. Let's see what I set in my script. In my script, I set 9,000. Okay, maybe you don't necessarily need 12,000. 12, maybe that's like additional. I can't remember, but uh, you basically just need to open the ports for remote management and your clients. And again, you can do that from anywhere on the internet or specific to your IP range. I'll get to questions in just a minute. I'm going to get through a little bit more of this one. So fail to ban, I don't know. I, it's kind of like one of those things. It's not, it's, it's okay. It's just the only, if, it's good if you have a lot of different services running. If you have like SSH and you have, I don't know, FTP and I don't, if you have a whole bunch of different services running, it's more helpful. But if you just, if people are brute forcing your SSH and you're using key auth instead of password auth, they're never going to get in. They're never going to guess your key. Uh, like that's like it comes down to math at that point. I'm pretty confident you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. So it's nice to have, but honestly, if you're not running a whole bunch of other services, database services and otherwise, you probably shouldn't be running publicly in the first place. Then I don't know what kind of ROI. It's definitely nice to have. Like it's not going to hurt anything, but it just basically auto blocks stuff when they see, it looks at log files, see if there's weird patterns, people trying to do stuff and it blocks them. But I don't know, it's, to me, it's very optional. Disable root account, 
eh. I mean, you don't, they're kind of disabled anyways, in a way. You can't really log in as root default anymore on Ubuntu. So I don't worry too much about that. I'll just try to make sure I don't run the clients as admin user. That's more useful as I talked about previously. Two-factor auth, also pretty cool. You can use uh, the lib, libpam Google Authenticator and you can set up two-factor auth for a login. That's pretty cool. So if you want to be the, like, the most secure possible, SSH key with a password and two-factor auth with Google Authenticator. But I, yeah, that's, you're going, you're going pretty far. Like at, again, at the end of the day, it's not like, if, if somebody could hack your validator and then steal your keys, like if it was like one for one like that, it'd be different. You like really need to hold the, hold down the fort. But if the worst they can do is they get you slash, but then get, I guess at home, there's different risks. Again, they get on your network and start hacking your other computers and stuff like that. But if you're in the cloud, that's one thing you don't have to worry about. They can only access more stuff on your cloud. Sure, they could they could put a key logger on your validator server and hope you type in something sensitive that allows them somehow to get to your own network, but it's a stretch, we'll say that. Shared memory, I I mean, I think that's optional too. It's not a lot of, very situation specific. If you have stuff that that works better for, it's good, but it's kind of, I'd say low ROI for most people. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. So this is what I talked about earlier. Use a count. That's the least privilege. And this goes back to computer security fundamentals. Privilege of least, what's it called? Privilege of least principle. Uh, privilege, principle of least privilege. There you go. You only want to give it what it needs to run and nothing more. Uh, again, I, I could give you a... Uh, graduate course in security stuff, but it's a lot of the stuff is uh, stick to the basics. All right. So we got through that. That's a good start. A lot of the good basics. Check that out. And I will get to questions here. CMA says, yep. And then hijacks recession. This still needs to pseudo pass for doing damage. Yeah. Hijacks recession. There's a lot of nuance in that one too, but yeah, that's, you definitely don't want it, you don't want them to be on your local network at all and your uh, pseudo password is should be protected exactly mike says i know david feeder's offering consulting service to help manage validator would you consider offering a similar service mike i do not monetize i do not sell my time i try to get away from that I, you know i want more freedom not less if I have clients, then I have less freedom, uh, logically. So nothing against people who do it. More power to you. I don't monetize. I don't sell my services, at least currently. That's my that's my style. That's my principles. Um, yeah, and that's why. So happy to, you know, I try to do the, these AMAs. This is kind of like my, my patronage to the community. Uh, try, to, try to do AMAs, you know, answer DMs from time to time. But I don't see myself uh, getting, I've had people, what, maybe more than one people, actually, yeah, definitely more than people. I've had a few people offer to pay me and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, it, it's just, I don't want to, I don't want to sell my time. I've been selling my time for a long time and uh, I just don't want to sell it. I can give it to you uh, for free, a certain amount of it, but I can't, don't, uh, don't want to sell my time. So appreciate it though. Luckily, there's plenty of other people in the community doing that. Yeah, David, I think Gamma's got one on one. So they're holding down that fort. Hey, Simba, welcome. Mainnet is so close, isn't it? So close. Have there been any bugs found recently? If you're talking about in testnet, I think this, the, what they're doing some beacon, the beacon chain stuff, some of the stuff's not enabled. I don't know if there's any bugs in particular. But if you go to Pulse Dev, uh, there's some conversation around some some of the beacon stuff, maybe. I know I was getting, it might have just been on my side, but I was uh, having problems looking at something earlier this morning on the validator side, but nothing critical. I don't think anything anything big. So do not disable root. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance to that, but in general, I just don't feel like it's worth it. I sell my time and stuff all the time. Yep. Yeah. You can choose to do that. I mean, we all do it in a certain way. So 
I just, I just avoid doing it. We'll say that we all do it in a certain way, but uh, yeah, I avoid doing it. Take screenshots, list fairs. Yeah, that's if you have. That's what these AMAs are for. This is number nine. That means I've done eight before this, as well as a lot of other conversations uh, and stuff too. So um, check out the other AMAs. I guess I probably have ten or fifteen hours of content going through a lot of these different questions and setup and stuff. And or again, if you have specific questions, uh, feel free to ask. Validator curious. I like that. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. Uh, if you want to learn about Linux, you want to learn about security, learn about validators, it's a stream for you, sir. Yeah, no worries, Fox. Yeah, I'll tell. Is it really 70 PLS a day for one validator? I have no idea. I don't know where you got that number. I'm not saying it's not correct, but I, if you ask me how much per PLS per day for a validator, I could not tell you. The API goes up and down. Testnet's going to be different than mainnet. I don't have a concrete numbers on that. So maybe I will one day or maybe somebody else will and I'll start quoting them. But yeah, I don't know. Remy, can you walk through exiting validator and then what's wrong? Yeah, you know what? Before I go into the next security, I did publish withdrawal instructions recently. So I will pulse um, the next security section and go through that real quick. I'll just share the link mostly because this is preliminary stuff. So... I put it in there because I just want to make sure people have information. I, I you know, I didn't want to just like hold it because it's not, it's not complete. That's why I didn't want to share it. So, you know, like I'm still, I'm still working through these processes and trying to synthesize it for you and, and go through the steps and stuff, but I'm very close. I got, it's mostly complete. Uh, but again, do not be extra careful. This is the time to test stuff on test net. Do not use these instructions for mainnet. This testing is not completed. Use your own use. Hold yourself fully accountable for control of actions with your own funds, just like all other parts of crypto, okay? There are full withdrawals and partial withdrawals. So we're going to focus on full withdrawal. And then here's the different stuff. I'm not going to go through all of it and read it. But if you didn't set a withdrawal address, because I know a lot of people didn't, I didn't for, for my validators. So I was going through that process. The launch pad is not available to do all the steps. So there's like three steps. You need to, if you didn't set a withdrawal address, you need to upgrade your keys. Just think about it like that. And then use the staking deposit client to broadcast it uh, or using the stake deposit client and then broadcast it with the launch pad. But I asked Gamma, I was like, hey, I see all the ETH tutorials. You just go to beaconchain.in and you do it. But where is their equivalent? equivalent? He's like, ah, launch pad. It, devs haven't put on launch pad yet. So not critical. This is kind of a corner case. You know, on, you know it's test net on mainnet. You know, you should set up a draw address. But um, anyway, it's not available yet. I'm sure it will be. And then, then you can exit. So you update your keys. You broadcast it. Here are my updated keys. And then you exit your validator. So again, this is not available right now, as far as I know. Could be any day. But the other two parts are so again uh when you're when you're generating your withdrawal keys do it on a different machine treat it like your seed words all that stuff just like you would on your when you're originally doing this stuff and here are the steps of how to do it you clone it you go through the process again here's all the stuff read that it'll tell you uh, you know this is confirmed you have access to the wallet be very very careful you could lose all your funds seriously be extremely careful that whatever wallet you set as your withdrawal address, that you will and always have access to that. If you don't, there's no recovery method. This is be your own bank. So hold yourself accountable and do the right thing and get this get this correct. There's, there's a, your, your withdrawal address is your money. Your seed words are your money. So treat your money, uh, keep your money safe. And then so that's the upgraded keys process. And then again, when I have, when the launch pad is available, I'll put the broadcast to launch pad process here and the exit process. So if, with Lighthouse, you run these commands, validator exit, and you set it to the public key of the validator that you want to exit. You could have more than one validator, but you set it to the one you want to exit to that key store, to that JSON. 
You enter the password, key store password, just like you generated before with the validators. And then you enter the exit phrase, which is at this link. So you go to that link, go to the exit phrase, it'll tell you, just make sure you read the docs. And then it'll say, you know, says validated, publish a voluntary exit. And then you gotta wait so long for it to do that. So that is the process. And then you'll see on the Beacon Explorer going from active to exit and like pulsing green uh, until it exits. And here are all the docs that I used in the video that I used to figure all this stuff out. Max is good at research, isn't he? That is kind of my, you know, we talk about superpowers and stuff, not having an emotional response to everything, staying calm, not getting angry, you know, not losing your peace, doing research. I gotta, I gotta say my professional life has made me above average doing research and synthesizing information, putting it together, understanding the nuance and then generating and sharing with you all. So I'm uh, happy, happy to have that skill that can be, have utility with here. All right, back to security. So before I go to the next link, I will say hi. Believe in yourself that once you begin trading time dollars, so it's, yeah, slippery slope. Yeah, exactly. The uh, was a quote the other day. Don't get addicted to monthly salary. Get addicted to monthly salary. You uh, may not be looking for any other way to live. I'll say that. So whenever that, um, let's look at the backups real quick. And then I will, yeah. Get outside. Um, how long have we been going? 42? Yeah, I'll go for about an hour. So now I'll talk for another 15 minutes or so, cover a bunch of stuff, and then uh, post your questions now because we're I'm going to go for about an hour today. So let's talk about backups, and then I'll get into the other stuff. So I've been trying to add all this stuff on the wiki. Backups. Yeah, I went over this a little bit earlier. Or no, I went over it yesterday. Never yesterday. So on Linux, if you're doing a home server, basically you want to use rsync. And yeah, I didn't write any guidance on this because I'm 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 not my stuff isn't tailored to home servers, but not too hard to figure out. You know, use rsync to do backups. There's probably scripts out there you can use on GitHub otherwise. So just check that out. Here's the the best links I found for that. On the cloud, you can do snapshots. So snapshots will allow you to spin up another instance. So take a point in time of what you what your server looks like. So you get your server all synced. I'm pretty sure this is what the devs do. They, I remember Richard and stuff talking about snapshots and EBS volumes and all this stuff. So imagine you have a bunch of validator servers. Not validators, but validator servers. You have four or five different servers that you want to run a bunch of validators on like the dev team, for example, or you just be yourself. And you set them up and each one, then you take a snapshot of that hard drive. Or you just set up one and then you create a bunch of other servers and you say, use this snapshot of the previous server's hard drive because it's got the blockchain synced. It's got everything set up on it already. All I got to do is import the keys and get it activated and we're good to go. So the few different ways you can use snapshots, one, is for backups. So regularly on AWS, and there's all the instructions how to do all this stuff. You can take snapshots to say, okay, if your validator does get hacked or something, you can roll it back to beforehand. And assuming they don't keep exploiting the same security hole and you change your passwords or whatever it is, figure out how they got in. Assuming you fix that, you can roll back and now, hey, they're not on there anymore. It's like it never happened as far as locally on that server. So you can use it for a backup. You can use snapshots as a way to easily spin up new instances or use Terraform, infrastructure's code type of thing, which I believe the Pulse Chain devs are doing because I've heard rumblings of that in the last few months as well, to set one up, take a snapshot, and then say, spin me up 20 more servers and use this snapshot as that base OS, as that sync blockchain. So I can quickly get spun up, you know, import what I need to do, and I don't have to go through the same process manually each time. So you can use a snapshot for DevOps type stuff too. So snapshots are pretty cool. That's one advantage of using the cloud. You don't have to like set up your own rsync and cron tab stuff. Uh, totally fine, you can totally do that. You can install commercial software, you can do whatever you want. But in the cloud, everything's virtual. 
And there's advantages to that, such as using the snapshot service AWS provides and all the cloud providers uh, as well, I'm sure. So that is backups. So check that out. And then I recommend everyone watch this video. Oops. Let me put it up here. So this is a great video by Crypto Manufacturer. Nice. And it really gives you a good baseline. I learned a lot from myself about validator security. It's, you know, it's like two years old, but I mean, it's super still relevant. It's about ETH 2.0. A lot of it's st still the same. So that's really cool. And so I definitely recommend checking this out. I dropped the link in the chat. And I want to cover DDoS protection. So I know if you're running websites and stuff, you can use Cloudflare and stuff. I've talked to Gamma about this. Uh, if you're exposing RPC services, uh, maybe you can use different DDoS protections. But if you're running a validator, I can, I just think that I don't know of any specific services to prevent that. But also I don't know how big of a risk it is either because people forget, people are like, oh, it's not just like you just click a button. Some person just clicks a button and it takes a server down. There's no cost to them. They need to expend resources to do that. So why would they target your validator in particular? Maybe they don't. Maybe they target other ones. Maybe they, you know, I need to see more case studies where people use DDoS attacks or denial of service attacks, DOS. It's like a specific instance. DDoS is like a distributed DOS, which means multiple servers are attacking one. DOS just means like uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one deal. I need to see more case studies around why that's, why there's ROI there for, for there to be protection. And the fact that commercial services like Cloudflare don't seem to be specifically supporting that don't sound like there's a big customer base either. So maybe it's not something you have to worry about as much. Uh, I'd love to hear opposing views and references for that, but I haven't, uh, I'm not sure DDoS protection is relevant for validators as my current understanding. So if that helps anyone who was wondering about it. Now, what can happen? Let's see, I'll put it here. I got the security section. So one of the biggest questions that I was wondering about is what can happen? What is the worst that can happen if your validator gets hacked? I kind of over already touched on this. As far as I know, the worst that can happen if your validator gets hacked, your, your validator keys are stolen because they're probably on there and all that stuff, or either like, you know, cause your validator is using them. So they're, they're in there one way or another or they just have control of your servers so they can influence the clients in other ways too. It doesn't really have to exactly steal the keys, but they have control of, over what you're doing on the validator. Worst that can happen is you lose some pulse or ETH, whatever network you're running, and you have a forced exit. You're like, you're so bad, you get slashed that you're just gone. They can pretend to be it. They can do other stuff like that. So not the end of the world. You don't want it to happen, but not the end of the world. You can do a backup get back online, make sure they don't hack into it. You know, if, if you can figure out what happened and then you're good. It's not like they're going to take your money. They're not going to take your deposit just by hacking your validator server. One doesn't equal one on that. It's not, not the, it's not the way to do it. However, if for some reason your seed word drawn that validator, yes, then they can, if they get your seed words one way or another, whether it's on your validator, which you shouldn't be, it should be generated, you know, on a different device, all that stuff we talked about a million times or they somehow they hack your validator and then they somehow get on another computer on your network that has your seed words, which again, shouldn't be there. It should not be kept digitally. It should be on paper or metal, just as if you're treating your wallet, your cold storage wallet for anything else. Kind of treat it in that way because your seed words equal your deposit. Think about it like that. Whoever has your seed words, you don't own anything on the blockchain. You have access to it. So even the words... Even your money, it's not even your money. It's just you happen to generate, uh, you had you happen to come up with an address that on the blockchain that that values are set where it says there's there's value there, there's money there, and you happen to have access to it. So if your seed words are the money, you should protect them in that way. So just getting a validator hacked doesn't mean they can steal your POS. They may get you slashed. They may get you penalized, but they can't. 
steal it directly unless they get your seed words. Um, because your seed words allow you to do two things, recover your validator keys and initiate a withdrawal. So because the withdrawal key is derived from the you know, 24 monomic seed words. So again, this is why you should generate your seed words offline, nowhere near your server, keep them, uh, keep them out of memory, keep them out of file system, keep them you know, paper metal, secure spot, just as if they were your money. Does that make sense, everyone? So that was the biggest question for me that I, I didn't understand at first. It was like, what happens if reality gets hacked? And then did the research, watched the video, able to present that. So I asked ChatGPT. Last thing I'll cover before we wrap up, I asked ChatGPT, what are some things to do to keep your server secure? Uh, give me, I said to give me like 12 things or something like that. Uh, it says use a dedicated machine, run your validator on a separate dedicated machine and minimize tax service. Cool. Keep your software updated. That's uh, that's good for everything. Have you ever seen a security AMA of mine? It's like simple security stuff. Keep your seed words safe one way or another and update your browser because most attacks these days happen from browsers, not your IP address, unless you're running a validator server. But most of the things when you're browsing the internet are browser attacks, email attacks, phishing attacks, run the CXC attacks. They're not targeting your browser's IP address. Uh, but if you're in a validator server, you know, that then, then they would be targeting your IP address and the service is running on it. But again, we've already went through how to keep that stuff up to date. Keep your clients up to date in case there's any security bugs. Keep your operating system up, up to date because there's security bugs from time to time. Uh, ChatGPT says enable firewall. Yeah, we talked about that. Use strong, unique passwords or use keys. They're even better. Implement 2FA. We talked about 2FA as well. You can do that on SSH. Harden your operating system, disable unnecessary services applications. Um, sure, but just use a clean operating system and don't install a bunch of stuff. That's a general way to have a good time. Employee network segmentation. So that's like a VPC type thing, but you're in the cloud. It could be a segregating your LAN. So again, if you want to, if you're running in a home, I would recommend you separate it from your home network. So basically you, you use two routers. So you have a router that all your stuff in your home network, your Wi-Fi, all this stuff goes on. And then for your validator ser server, you have another router that has access to the internet, but it is, is isolated from everything else. And you only plug in physically through ethernet, you plug your validator server into that router. Again, away from your network, turn off Wi-Fi, don't need any of that. That's how I would do it. I would, I would have it on a separate network if I was running at home. And you can Google for how to do that stuff as well. Uh, and then monitor logs and alerts. Yeah, on AWS, they have some logs and stuff. But um, I mean, yeah, keep your keep, keep your AWS keys safe. Keep your username and password safe. I guess that's one thing we didn't talk about. But anyone who can log into your, or can disable console access, but that means you need to use know how to use AWS CLI, which for, you know, for not for not advanced users, all the advanced users use CLI. A lot of them, I like the web. I like the web concept from time to time. But you know, it is it is a uh, yeah. Keep your password off, and your uh, turn on two FA on your account. That's another good thing too. Uh, that's about it. I mean, talked about backups. HSM is not super accessible for the commodity people. Limit physical access. Yeah, I mean that's something. Make sure people can't literally physically come and stick a USB key in your server or steal your server and go work on it otherwise. Educate yourself. Cool. Yeah, pretty good advice from ChatGPT on that too. All right, that's, I think that's all I got for you. I think that's pretty useful. And we're wrapping up questions. Anyone? What's, what's uh, let's believe in yourself, got to say. Recently revealed missile exulting call display on the front. Told me the site was needed more modern browser, generally use Chrome. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean up to date Chrome's fine. Update Firefox is fine. Just up to date. That's what you need. Up to date. Only people once. Yeah. There you go. It is painful to learn, but it's ROI, right? You get what do you get out of learning? Knowledge. <laughs> Oh, uh, shout out to Ty Lopez. Knowledge. Epic. All right. I'm going to drop the scripts in the chat again. Try to automate most of the stuff for you. Uh, I've been trying out a snapshot script, but it's taken forever. 
we'll see. I'm going to add some more stuff about withdrawals. That's what I'm working on now. Hopefully the devs add some stuff on Launchpad to help with that too. But yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is, I think a lot of the materials and code and commands and stuff, Gamma has been releasing some new stuff, feeders, you know, all over it, tutorials and otherwise all complimentary. Um, I love automation. I love code. So if you want to automate most of your validator setup, that's what we do here. We do that. And I'll drop it in the chat. And there we go. <laughs> Believe me, so tough. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Wind pulse chain. So close. So close. All right, everyone. That's what I got for you today. Go out there, be the best validators you can. Or if you're validator curious, hope you learned something. I'm gonna take a break. Enjoy the rest of uh, my day as well. Sci vibe and five 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 five. We are out. <laughs> <laughs>